Well, we are at week two in our sermon series, See All the People. And for four weeks, we're going to be listening uh, to stories about Jesus. And in all of these stories, we're going to notice one thing in particular, and that each story that we uh, hear and talk about, each story includes lots of people surrounding Jesus. Wherever Jesus is, there's a crowd. So Jesus sees these people. He sees the crowd around him, and he preaches to them. He teaches. He heals them. And he does so with the very immediacy and power of God. There is no doubting his authority. And the crowds around him keep growing. The people keep coming to be wherever Jesus is. I think it's important for us to understand that Jesus truly does see the crowds. He sees all of these people. And he responds to their needs. He recognizes that these people gathering around him, that they need God in a variety of ways. And Jesus offers them nothing less than God. Jesus preaches to their hearts so that they could know without a shadow of a doubt that God loves them with an unconditional love. And that really their fulfillment is in loving God back. And Jesus teaches to their minds so that they can know how God would want them to live, so that they could experience abundant life. And Jesus heals their bodies. He takes care of their bodies so that they can know God's promise of renewal in a very tangible, intimate way. Jesus truly meets all of these people, and he meets their needs. The question is for us today, do we? Do we? Do we go and meet the crowds beyond our doors? Do we even know what people need beyond our church? What are their needs? In our story today, as I said, Jesus was up on a mountain, actually just before our story. Jesus is up on the mountain praying to God all night with those closest to him. But notice in our scripture as we start that story that Jesus didn't stay on that mountain. He didn't stay on that mountain all by himself, just hanging out with God and those closest to him. No, no, Jesus came down the mountain. He came to the crowds. He met the crowds. And then he stood on a stretch of level ground. He came down the mountain. He stood on level ground in the midst of a very large gathering. It included the um, bigger crowd of his disciples, the ones that were not with him on the mountaintop, but it also included a huge crowd of people from all the surrounding area. Jesus is in the midst of them. And in doing so, he identifies himself as one of them. He's right there in the thick of it with them. And so he preaches and he teaches and he heals, not from a superior place, but from a place of equality and togetherness. He's in it with them. So will we meet the crowds like Jesus did? I wonder if we will come down from our mountain. Will we move out of the places like this church, like this sanctuary, where 
We are experiencing communion with God. We are experiencing fellowship with one another. But will we leave this mountaintop of our church in order to go down and meet the people? Or will we stay here on the mountain, in our church, and focus only on ourselves, on our relationship with God and with each other? Will we meet the crowds like Jesus did? I wonder if we will offer Jesus' mission on level ground, in the same spirit of equality and togetherness that he exhibited, with, you know, especially with those beyond our church. Or will we consider ourselves some, in some way somehow superior to people out there, Will we feel that we are better than them? Or will we remember that every single one of us, whether we are in the church or beyond the church, that every single one of us is made in the image of God, that we are precious in God's sight, and at the same time, that every single one of us needs God's ongoing forgiveness and grace. We're not all perfect. We are going on to perfection. We need God's grace every single day, each and every one of us. None of us are exempt from that. Well, we remember that we're all in this together, this human thing, this human life, and that all of us, every single one of us, um, we need saving help every day within the church and beyond the church. Will we meet the crowds like Jesus did. Will we do it? I think as we consider this question, even as we pray this question, we should ask ourselves, well, what would prevent us from meeting people and their needs like Jesus did? What would be some obstacles that could get in our way? Jesus knows He knows what those obstacles are. He named some of them right here in our story. This was so captivating to me when I noticed this little detail in the story. So a picture Jesus ministering in the middle of this huge crowd. And he's preaching and he's teaching and he's healing. And there's a line in Scripture that we could miss if we're reading too quickly. But it says that Jesus raised his eyes. He raised his eyes from the crowd and the work he was doing with and for the crowd. He raised his eyes and he looked at his disciples. And he spoke to them directly. And he spoke the hard sayings that we heard just a bit ago. And they are hard. They are hard for us to hear. They are hard for us to understand. Let's hear him again, maybe in some just simplified language. Jesus said to his disciples, Happy are the poor now, for they will be rich. Happy are the hungry now, for they will be satisfied. Happy are the weeping now, for they will laugh. Happy are the hated, the rejected, the insulted, and the condemned, for they will be rewarded. And then he goes on to say, it's terrible for the rich now because their comfort will run out. It's terrible for the well provided for, because they will go without. It's terrible for the ones who laugh with enjoyment, because they will grieve and weep. And it's terrible for those who are popular and pleasing because they will be seen as fakes. We can't miss, we shouldn't miss, 
that Jesus is saying these things to his disciples. Jesus is talking to us. He is telling us what will get in the way of our truly meeting people and meeting their needs. We can really take all of those happies and terribles, those blesseds and woes, and we can boil it down to two very important things. Not trusting God and not having urgency. These are the things that will get in the way of our meeting new people and their needs with the good news of Jesus Christ. Because when you look at all of those happies and you look at all of those terribles, what's at, at heart, at issue here, is not trusting God and not having a sense of urgency about God's saving work and the power of God. You know, it's not that being rich is bad in and of itself. It's not as if having plenty is bad in and of itself. It's not bad to take enjoyment and laugh in life. And it's not a bad thing to want to have a good reputation. That's not what Jesus is saying. He is saying instead that it is clinging to these things, these outer things, putting our trust there, our sense of security, putting our sense of identity in all of that. That is what is dangerous to us as his disciples. It's dangerous for us because When we are overly comfortable, we're not trusting God. And we're not acting in God's mission with urgency. When we are investing too much in our security, when we are investing too much in ourselves being taken care of, we are not in fact trusting God and acting with urgency. When we're too concerned with our own preferences or what's pleasing to us, we are not trusting God and we are not acting in urgency toward his mission. The fact of the matter is when we cling too tightly to all of these things, we are in danger of losing our capacity to trust God in everything and for everything. We increasingly see ourselves as the ones in control of our lives. And we fail to let God lead and guide us. And we fail to experience any kind of urgency around God's saving work to the point where we think everything is just fine for us. Everything is just fine for our church. And therefore, there's no necessity to change or to adapt especially when the culture is changing. And if we buffer ourselves from the critical needs that other people are facing beyond our church, then we really don't feel any necessity to do anything about them either. But something powerful happens when we go into the crowds, when we meet the crowds and their needs. Something powerful happens when we allow ourselves, like Jesus, to be in touch with poverty, poverty in all of its forms. Something powerful happens when we allow ourselves to be touched by hunger and weeping. Something powerful happens when we take culturally unpopular and displeasing stands for the sake of God's justice and peace. Something powerful happens when we take risks to do that because then we will have no illusions about our self-sufficiency or our control. When we become in touch with the heartbreak of the world, It's then that trusting God is our only way. It is our only hope, and it is the source of our only real strength. 
It's when we are out there in the thick, meeting people and meeting their, their trials and tribulations, their heartache, that we realize that we need God and we need God now and we need to act. We need to be living and working for Jesus right now. There's a lot at stake then. Most recently, we learned about the importance of trust and urgency at our vision day that we had last month. And we learned about uh, trusting God and um, the importance of urgency in the context of looking at the life cycle of a church. Just the life cycle of a church. You see, when a church is founded, or when a church experiences a kind of new birth, there is this period of exciting, rapid growth. There's new members, there's new programs and ministries, there's a growing staff, there's new buildings, and there's expanding financial support. It's exciting. But at some point, that rapid growth can hit a peak, and it begins to plateau. Everything is still going strong, so at this point, few people notice that the church is actually no longer growing, and actually the church is no longer changing or adapting its ministries. When everything is going strong and people can't um, see the plateau, most churches will then subtly, gradually shift into a conservation mode. And there the focus is on maintenance and preservation and complacency sets in. The very thing that Jesus warns about in our scripture passage. Over time... If you're in conservation mode, over time, worship attendance drops. Active involvement involvement declines. Everything that once worked so well is less and less effective. But churches, interestingly enough, in this conservation mode, will keep on investing in things the same things that worked decades ago because they want to hold on to what is left for as long as possible. The problem and the danger is that in conservation mode, we are clinging so tightly to our past that we forget to trust God for our future. And we fail to see any urgency in doing so. Now, if nothing changes in this conservation mode, most churches will continue to decline. And they will decline until they die. What we learned at Vision Day is that if a church truly wants to experience new life, then it must again learn how to trust God. It must again discover a new urgency toward the mission that God has given the church. And we learn that this part of the life cycle is called release. Release. In release mode, a church begins to loosen its grip on trying to hold on to the glory years and all the things that got them to that uh, peak of glory. And it opens itself up to new ways of being the church and fulfilling its mission. It's precisely in release when a church must trust in God and act with urgency Because only through trust in God and only through urgency will the church have the courage to creatively experiment with fresh ways of meeting new people and meeting their needs. And in the releasing, as as the church continues to release, there is the possibility of renewal and then of going back into that rapid growth part of the cycle again. Because when things are released, 
The Holy Spirit brings renewal, and God's saving work continues to unfold, both within the church and beyond the church. So with this in mind, as we think about this life cycle of a church in our minds, I want us to go back again to the question that we started out with, the question that was given to us by our scripture lesson this morning. Will we meet the crowds like Jesus did? Well, to do so, we have to avoid the obstacles that Jesus describes. We must hold on to all things loosely except the mission God gives to us. To make disciples of Jesus Christ, to grow disciples of Jesus Christ, and to serve as disciples of Jesus Christ. We have to practice what I like to think of as a holy indifference to anything that doesn't help us fulfill this mission. And so we can't cling. We can't cling to traditions or programs. We can't cling to staff or pastors or other leaders. We can't cling to our resources as if they, in and of themselves, will save us. Because without a living and active trust in God and without a sense of urgency around the necessity for Jesus and his mission today, without these things, we are not going to meet all the people and their needs with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what does this all mean for this church? Well, Vision Day was only a month ago, so we are only just beginning to identify areas of our congregation in need of release and renewal. And so we invite you to join with the whole church in a season, a period, of prayerful discernment. We want to uh, have you wrestle with the following questions. What do we need to release back to God? What do we need to release? Where in our church do we need to trust God? And what urgent needs do people beyond us face? What needs are out beyond our doors? And how will we respond with Jesus' power? God is not just leading our church, but he is leading each and every one of us as followers of Jesus to the very places and people we are called to love and to serve. He is calling us to meet all the people Let's hear Jesus' call to a new adventure. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God, we confess that we haven't loved you and the crowds as we should. It seems we let obstacles get in our way. Oh God, teach us to trust in you and your goodness. Give us an urgency about the necessity of Jesus and his mission right now, within this place and beyond it. The time is now. Give us the courage and confidence to begin again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.